What the world needs is Christians who cannot be bought, whose word is their bond, who put character above wealth, who possess opinions and a will, who are larger than their vocations, who will not lose their distinctiveness in a crowd, who will be as honest in small things as in great things, who do not believe that shrewdness and cunning are the best qualities for winning, who are not ashamed to stand for the truth when it is unpopular, and who say no with emphasis, although the rest of the world says yes. Stephen has a lesson for you today entitled, Ruining the Reputation of God. That's a sobering thought, isn't it? Imagine being part of ruining God's reputation, but it's a real danger. The Apostle Paul said that it's possible to boast in religion and at the same time dishonor God. The Pharisees in Paul's day did that, and in our day, there are plenty of people in churches on Sunday who ruin God's reputation the rest of the week. Keep listening because we're going to learn how we can avoid this pitfall and live in ways that bring honor to God. Stephen is in a series called Got Religion? And his lesson today is entitled Ruining the Reputation of God. Here's Stephen. In Romans chapter 2, beginning with verse 17, the apostle has revealed six reasons why the Jew felt eternally safe before God. We have explored those. He believed that he was safe because he possessed a special name, Jew. He possessed a copy of the law. He was proud of his monotheism. He had insight into the will of God. He had the ability to discern between good and evil. And finally, he had been biblically catechized. He had been educated in Old Testament law, All of that did not constitute, however, true safety. And I couldn't help but believe that there are many that would believe they are eternally safe because they also claim the special name of Christian. They possess a copy of the Bible, probably half a dozen copies or so. They're proud to claim Elohim as their God instead of Allah or Krishna. They have an ability to discern between moral evil and good. They have received a something of a Sunday school education, not only in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament as well. And yet, like the faithful Jew, they will one day discover it was not good enough to enter paradise. The Apostle Paul then, beginning in verse 19, gave four reasons why the faithful Jew felt entirely superior before men. They considered themselves, first of all, to be the spiritual supervisors of mankind. That is, they were guides to the blind. And Jesus would say in Matthew 15, 14 of them, you are blind guides of the blind. And if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into a pit. And thus they were leading people in their self-deception into failure and loss spiritually. Secondly, they considered themselves to be enlightened. They said, we have seen the light. We know light from darkness. Follow us. Third, they felt superior because they considered themselves to be the standard of morality. They knew right from wrong. And finally, they considered themselves to be the spring of wisdom. The Jew believed that if the Gentile would simply be converted to Judaism and listen to their teaching, that they would be rescued from hell. How shocking it must have been and how devastating to have heard the words from Jesus Christ's own lips in Matthew 23 when he said to them, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you travel about on sea and land to make one convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. How many people would consider themselves to be superior today to the rest of the world simply because they know the truth of the Bible? Like the Jew, they are concerned over the waywardness of the world. Like the Jew, they are concerned about the standards of morality. They encourage people to join their church, to join in their teaching, perhaps to learn from them. But in reality, the converts to their churches only become more confirmed in spiritual pride and hypocrisy than before, and even more entrenched on the road that leads to hell than ever before. They had become religious converts, but they are still unredeemed. Religion has become for them, as for millions of others, the road that leads to hell. You say, how do I know if I've been deceived? How can I examine 
by faith to see if I am truly redeemed. Well, in the next few verses that we began to explore in our last session, Paul began asking five questions that ultimately revealed the reality of good soil and good seed, which then grows up and bears good fruit for God's glory. And in our last discussion, we began with these questions that Paul was asking in a rather rhetorical fashion. In verse 21, he asks the moral, the faithful Jew, you therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? What this question reveals about the religious hypocrite, the person who is self-deceived into thinking that they are safe while they are in fact under judgment and in danger of eternal punishment is this. The religious man communicates truth without ever applying it to their own lives. That is, without genuine personal application. In other words, to his audience, the faithful Jew knew the truth, taught the truth of the law, but had never applied the truth to their own lives. You could say it this way. Their religious creeds did not produce righteous conduct. What they said to others about what they believed did not matter in terms of how they behaved. Now, the reaction of Paul's audience was anticipated. He anticipated the faithful Jew to sort of recoil back and sort of shudder and say, what do you mean we are teaching others, but we have not learned it ourselves? We keep the law diligently. Have you not seen us in our praying, in our fasting, in our tithing? Look at all the things we don't do in an effort to live righteous lives. They had created 365 prohibitions, uh, one a day that they didn't do in an attempt to be righteous uh, before men. We keep them all and we are teachers of God's commandments. Like the young man who came to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ would tell him in effect he needed to be born again. He was, he was lost. And in Matthew 19, he said, well, wait a second, I have kept all of the commandments. You see, that was the prevailing thought of the Jew in, in this day. We're keeping all of it. And if we've broken some things, we haven't broken the big ones. I'm a pretty good person. So people today say the same thing to you and to me. Why do I need to be redeemed? Why do I need to be saved? I haven't done anything that bad. I haven't broken any of the big ones. I would be safe. Now Paul then moves to specific things the Jews never thought of as they consider the depth of their hypocrisy before God. Middle of verse 21. You who preach that one should not steal, do you steal? Now remember, as I mentioned in our last study, Paul isn't saying outright you're a thief. He's asking a rhetorical question, expecting them in their hearts, having their consciences provoked to say, yes, I I am a thief. But he isn't calling them one. He's simply saying, do you steal? And he leaves it up to the Spirit of God to apply it to their heart. Perhaps someone in here is a thief. You're stealing the affections of someone's heart that does not belong to you. You're stealing credit for doing something that someone else did and you're receiving the praise. You are stealing from God by keeping your money and possessions to yourself. You're stealing your children from God by discouraging them from ever pursuing ministry for Christ and His church. Someone in here perhaps is stealing from their spouse the fidelity and devotion that belongs to them. Are you a thief? The Pharisees of Christ's day had come up with a rather clever scheme and way to keep money to themselves that they should have been using for their aging parents who were now dependent upon them for care. They took that discretionary money and they designated it with the word Corbin. They called it Corbin. That simply means devoted to God. Then they said to their parents, listen, we'd love to help you and we know you have financial needs, but all of our leftover money was dedicated to God and we just felt like we ought to commit it to God and so we can't give it to you and surely you wouldn't want to take what belongs to God. So in effect, they were stealing from their parents. Jesus' response to them in Mark 7 was, You honor God with your lips, but your heart is far from me. He saw to the core of the issue. You sound holy, but in reality, you're a hypocrite. You can talk it, but you don't walk it. So the religious man, first of all, communicates truth without personal application. Secondly, the religious man talks about integrity, but does not live honestly. Third, the religious man denigrates immorality without ever purifying his own heart. For Paul goes on in verse 22 to ask, You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? In other words, the merely religious person will talk about how terrible sexual sin is, but he will never work on his own heart. Remember, adultery is as much a matter of the heart as it is the flesh. 
The Lord said, if you look at one and lust after them, you've committed adultery with them already in your heart, Matthew 5, 28. Perhaps someone in here committed adultery this week by what they watched on the internet. Perhaps someone committed adultery by what they thought about someone they worked with this week. Perhaps someone committed adultery here by what they wished in their heart related to someone else. The one who would hear these challenges and is a believer would say in their heart, that is me. And oh, how dependent I am on the blood of Christ to forgive the nature that I have, which is so sinful. The one who is not a believer, the religious hypocrite would seek to justify his own actions and he would say, oh, that's not me. I might have seen some things I shouldn't have seen, but what's so bad about that? I might have thought some things about someone that I shouldn't uh, have thought about, but that's the way God made us. My friend, you are deceived by the enemy of your soul and your own flesh. You are religious, but you are unredeemed. One of the greatest evidences of true conversion is a passion for purity of heart and life. Not perfection, but passion. One of the greatest evidences of true conversion is repentance and confession. It is sorrow over sin, where Paul himself, the man that we probably could all somewhat agree was one of the most spiritual men living in his generation, and he said, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? The things that I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. There was an admission and sense of confession and total dependence upon God. Who will deliver me from this body of death? The phrase takes us back in culture to the time when a man committed murder. And if he killed someone who was a slave or of ill repute, they would often crucify that murderer and they would attach to his body face to face, cheek to cheek, arm to arm, leg to leg, the one he had killed. And the man would often die of insanity. That's what Paul is referring to. Who will deliver me from this body of death? The evil thing that I have done. Who will rescue me? That's the mark of a believer. The fourth question Paul has asked strikes at the issue of materialism. Timeless principle comes out of this vague text about stealing. You abhor idols, he says, but do you rob temples? It's a first century practice of marketing stolen idols of gold and silver. They wouldn't touch it. They wouldn't worship it. In a sense, they wouldn't go to the temple, but they would mark it in the gold and silver and thus become defiled. So in other words, the religious man talks about character, but he chooses commerce. Whenever the choice between God and money comes around, God always loses. One of the marks of the unbeliever is that whenever the choice has to be made between money or God, business or faith, career or character, money, business, and career always win the contest. It is commerce over character. It is greed over godliness. These are the marks of the unbeliever's self-centered life and heart. Now, these are just the first four questions. How would you answer them? Nobody in here knows the answers except you and God. Maybe those who live around you, who watch you, who live under the roof with you, have an inkling of what your answer would be. The Apostle Paul said that we're to examine ourselves to see if we're truly in the faith. How would you answer these? That's exactly what Paul is doing here in Romans chapter 2. To the religious world of his day, he is challenging them to answer the basic question, are you spiritually alive and is there evidence to reveal that? Or are you living a lie? And does the evidence reveal that. I remember the year before I gave my life to Christ as a senior in high school. My 11th grade year was a tumultuous year primarily because of the battle that was going on inside of me. I can remember wishing the invitation would end quickly, but there were always at least 30 verses. I was terrified of the rapture, afraid of being left behind. I had prayed a thousand times for God to save me. But God knew my heart. I was only interested in fire insurance. I had no desire for fellowship or forgiveness. I can remember as an 11th grader, for the most part, staying out of trouble. Missionary kid, I was sweeping the gym floor that afternoon. My brothers and I worked a little bit of scholarship for this Christian school to help my parents pay the tuition. It's quite a sacrifice for them to send us all there. Mr. Garrick was the superintendent He's now with the Lord. We didn't see much of him. We saw more of the principal and faculty than of him. He was also the associate pastor of a nearby church where I had spent my childhood. 
a very formal non-denominational church that was rather austere and they didn't sing those hymns that the other church sang. They sang the church is one foundation and a mighty fortress is our God. And the other church I went to later taught me those other hymns that I would rather not sing, at least at this point in my life. Mr. Garrick looked the part of his pastor, and he was a big man, tall. I remember his large hands. He always wore a serious look on his face. and I never saw him laugh, although I'm sure he did. I was sweeping the gym floor that afternoon, and I was alone, pushing one of those long dust brooms. And I was at about the half-court circle when the back door opened, and Mr. Garrick walked in. We didn't have an appointment. But he walked over to me, where I stood rather frozen, and he looked down at me, and with kindness, he said, you may have others fooled, but I know you're not genuine. You put on a good front, but I know you're living a lie. I remember my heart racing, and so was my mind. I, I wondered what he knew. I hadn't done anything they could suspend me for or punish me for. I was a missionary kid who never missed church. All my sins were legal. (laughs) But that wasn't his point. He was talking about something far more serious than that. He was discerning. He had found me out. And as abruptly as he came in, he turned and walked out. I can still remember his blue-gray suit and his black wingtips clicking along the maple floor. And he walked out. He didn't offer counsel. He didn't offer conversation. He had simply delivered a message from God. It's the same message that Paul is delivering to the religious people of his day. No, they are not about to be suspended from the synagogue, and they never missed a sacrifice. All their sins were legal, too. But Paul was talking about something much deeper than that. By God's Spirit, he was penetrating their heart and he was exposing it for what it was. My friend, I may not know your name, but I am here today to ask you, are you living a lie or are you spiritually alive? With that exposure to his audience now completed, Paul moves to the verdict in verse 23. You who boast in the law, through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. In other words, the Jewish people had kept the Roman law, but they were breaking the law of God. They were doing it in a couple of ways. They were disobeying His law through their ungodly attitudes and their ungodly actions. Ask the average person on the street about the Bible and they'll say it's a good book to own. It's a nice thing to quote at weddings and funerals and family reunions. But don't take it seriously. And ladies and gentlemen, here's the point. Here's Paul's point. Why should they take it seriously? Why should the world feel any other way when the supposed believer doesn't seem to be all that obligated or interested in obeying it? Why wouldn't the world say it doesn't matter because it doesn't matter to them? His point to the religious Jew is the verdict of today, he says in verse 23. You who boast in the law through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? Listen, you boast in the fact that you have the law of God. You boast that God's inspired record of right and wrong is yours. You have it. You own it. But you break it. You don't care about it. You don't live it. And you dishonor God. If you do not take your Bible seriously, his point is the world will not take your God seriously. And the real tragedy here in this text is not the failing credibility of the believer or the supposed believer, but the credibility of God himself. Look again at verse 24. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles, and that next phrase, because of you. In other words, not only is your reputation a mess, you're also ruining the reputation of God. The word blaspheme metai is transliterated blaspheme. The Greek word means to be evil spoken of, to speak lightly, profanely, or impiously of God. 
Paul quotes here from Isaiah 52, 5 when he says it is written, well, he's quoting from the prophet where God is speaking to the nation and saying, now therefore, what do I have here? Declares the Lord. Like a parent who walks in and says, well, what do we have here? God says, well, what do we have here? My name is continually blasphemed all day long. God speaks, some believe, Paul is quoting Ezekiel, as God spoke there in chapter 36, verse 20, they blasphemed my holy name in that men said of them, these are the people of Jehovah. In other words, the Jews were living such sinful lives among the Gentiles that the Gentiles, in effect, were saying, if this is the people of Jehovah, then what kind of God must Jehovah be? The same indictment came to David after sinning with Bathsheba, And then ordering her husband to be put on the front line in the battle in its fiercest moment for the soldiers in that battle to withdraw, leaving him to be killed. It happened. And we're aware of how Nathan came and said to him in 2 Samuel 12, 7, Thou art the man. We're familiar with that verse. We're not as familiar with verse 14 where Nathan says to him, David, by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of God to blaspheme. In other words, if you are a man of God, then what kind of God must you have to do the things you do? The believer then has a way of affecting the reputation of God. Two ways, one positively and one negatively. Positively, in Matthew 5, 16, Jesus Christ said, Live in a way that men may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. In other words, God's name can be honored and glorified by the way that you live. But here in Romans 2, 24, living a hypocritical life causes God's name to be blasphemed. In other words, the way we live, we can actually have His name dishonored and blasphemed. So in other words, the reputation of God depends upon the way we live? Yes. Has it ever occurred to you in the daily actions of your life and attitudes and responses and decisions of your lifestyle that God's own reputation is at stake? May I ask you a question? What is the reputation of God in your world? I love this ad that appeared in the East African Standard newspaper in Nairobi. It was put into a book by R. Kent Hughes that I read recently. Here's a man who came to faith in Christ, and it is obvious. The ad said this, quote, I, Alan Harangui, have dedicated my services to the Lord Jesus Christ. I must put right all my wrongs. If I owe you any debt or damage personally through my businesses of water pumps electrical and general sales and services, please contact me at post office box 73137 Nairobi for a settlement. No amount will be disputed. God and His Son, Jesus Christ, will be glorified. Isn't that great? Haven't seen any ads like that in the Raleigh News and Disturber lately, have you? What an incredibly effective testimony here. Something happened to this man, and he had to let his world know he's a different man. Let me give you three statements that are true in every generation, not only here in Rome, but in this city. Number one, the greatest attraction to Christianity is holy living. The greatest attracting force to the fact that Jesus Christ is who he said he is is that we live like he lived. The greatest evidence that this book is truly alive is that it lives in and through us. Two, the greatest obstacle then to Christianity is hypocritical Christians. If the first is true, the second then would be true. The world laughs and mocks at our Lord when they see those who claim the name of Christ live like the world. Perhaps you've heard somebody. I've had people say to me, the reason I don't go to church is because of all those hypocrites. Now, I usually don't let them get away with that. I'll come back with something like, well, you know, you're just the person that needs to be saved. Why? Well, because if you don't want to spend an hour with them in church, you don't want to spend forever with them in hell. Usually doesn't work, by the way, so don't go out and try that. <laughs> the greatest obstacle to Christianity is those who claim to be Christians, unfortunately. We can talk all about what we believe, but the world is watching how we behave, and the way we behave is so loud they cannot hear what we are saying. John Walford, the Chancellor of Dallas Seminary, once said at a graduation ceremony, I am afraid for this graduating class. I am afraid that we are turning out too many graduates who have a great number of beliefs, but not enough conviction. Final point in this summary statement would be this. I've said it a number of different ways. Let me say it this way. 
The Messiah is measured by the messenger. God will be judged by you and by me. His character will be defined by our character. That's why holy living and evangelism are considered inseparable. You see, you can teach mathematics and live an immoral life, and no student of yours would ever say, you're not qualified to teach me the principles of mathematics by virtue of the way you live. Oh, but if you said to that person, I believe in Jesus Christ, or thus saith the Lord, or the Bible teaches this, or I belong to God, and yet live an ungodly life, they will close their ears and mock your God. The Messiah is measured by the messenger. If there was ever a time for Christians to be different, distinctive, holy, passionate for purity, ethical, honest, self-controlled, hardworking, gracious, it is now. Let me read you what Ted Engstrom said as he put it this way. What the world needs is Christians who cannot be bought, whose word is their bond, who put character above wealth, who possess opinions and a will, who are larger than their vocations, who will not lose their distinctiveness in a crowd, who will be as honest in small things as in great things, who will make no compromise with sin, whose ambitions are not confined to their own selfish desires, who will not say they do it because everybody else does it, who are true to their friends through good report and evil report, in adversity as well as in prosperity, who do not believe that shrewdness and cunning are the best qualities for winning, who are not ashamed or afraid to stand for the truth when it is unpopular, and who say no with emphasis, although the rest of the world says yes. This is Wisdom for the Heart with Stephen Davey. The lesson you just heard is called Ruining the Reputation of God. You can listen to it again from our website. You'll find us online at wisdomonline.org. You'll be able to access the complete archive of Stephen's teaching ministry, as well as each day's broadcast. Again, it's wisdomonline.org. Wisdom International publishes a monthly magazine called Heart to Heart. Each issue features articles written to help you grow in your faith and a daily devotional guide to keep you rooted in God's Word. We send it as a gift to our Wisdom partners, and we'd be happy to send you the next three issues absolutely free to introduce you to this resource. Sign up online or call us today at 866-48-BIBLE. That's 866-482-4253. We'll get you signed up and you'll receive the next three issues that go out. Thanks for joining us today. Have a great weekend. Join us on Monday for our next lesson here on Wisdom for the Heart. Wisdom for the Heart.